1933, the United States seems literally besieged by hard times. The Great Depression is ravaging the economy. The struggling working class has become destitute, and the successful Wall Street executives are leaping from the windows of their high-rise corner offices. In the drought-stricken southern plains, high winds of choking dust are sweeping the region from Texas to Nebraska, killing people and livestock along the way. Even as President Franklin D. Roosevelt claims there is nothing to fear but fear itself, the FBI is warning the public of an even greater menace. A psychopathic, bank-robbing kidnapper with an affinity for automatic weapons is on the loose. A man they dub America's Most Wanted. He will lead the federal authorities on a cross-country chase and secure his place as one of the most recognizable names in gangster history. But is he truly one of the most dangerous men of his time? or an imaginative construct of an overzealous government agency. This is the legend of George Machine Gun Kelly. I wouldn't know a gunman if I saw one. Gangster Arrows Gunman. Five dudes of public enemies bring a rain of terror and sample police. How did this famous gangster treat you? He treated me wonderful. This here. But I'm telling you what I'm exposing. This is my do, 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 do. You know, sugar, the cops scared you. You don't listen to me so good sometimes. And stop calling me cute names and showing your garters. Georgie, you know I don't wear stockings. You like to be looked at, don't you? You like to be petted. You like soft things like silks and satin. Fur for your neck. Well, you just remember, baby. Something soft can choke you right into a soft dead. So, that was a clip from the 1958 movie Machine Gun Kelly, played by a young Charles Bronson. Ah. Interesting. You know, and it's really the most animated I think I've ever seen Bronson. I'm a huge Bronson fan, don't get me wrong, but he's usually kind of the same guy. Right. The quiet, soft-spoken, tough guy. Magnificent Seven. Yeah, yeah, or uh, Death Wish. Right. Yes, that's how I think of him. Yeah. And there's, there's been a few others. One, he was racing in the snow, doing the same kind of stuff. But uh, he was young in this and uh, really animated. Normally when I see uh, 50s movies, I kind of cringe because it's so hokey. This was done well. <laughs> I like the music. I like the scripts. It was a little bit over the top, but the way they played him was interesting. You heard in that clip, he was threatening his girlfriend, who was uh, called Flo, which is, you know, of course, a, not her name. It's a tweak. But he was very animated and very on edge, like a sociopathic, unstable personality. And uh, it was definitely a deliberate depiction to make him seem very dangerous. But was he? When I first started this story, I had intern do a little bit of research because I'm like, look, he's a huge name. He was America's Most Wanted. Dig up what you got. And he came back almost immediately and said, ah, he was he was nothing. It was a big ploy. It was a marketing thing from his wife. He was a patsy. And they actually called him Pop Gun Kelly in Alcatraz right. Prison. He, he was a puss. He's like, ah, he, there's nothing there. Jeez. So I dropped it. But then later on, I was like, ah, it doesn't seem quite right. You know, he, he's persisted too long. So I started digging more and more, and then I put Ree on the story. Great job, Ree, by the way, with the script. You came up with a ton of stuff. Her script got me interested, so then I dug in and got a little bit more, and I think we've got a, a really good show going on tonight, and uh, it'll be interesting. Partners in Crime, I'm your host, Bill Crooks. Just an ordinary guy, nothing to worry about. Off to my right in the Partners in Crime studio, we have narrator Zach the Zip Griffith. Hello, hello. And to his right, we have Anne-Marie Giuliano. Good afternoon. And a person who, while taking my dictation, I, I got to tell you this, writing notes for the Machine Gun Kelly script. I've got Joshua, the intern. I'm, I'm listening to docs. I'm doing what I'm doing, driving a car. And I'm like, hey, write this down. And I'm like, all these tidbits, I want to make sure I fit in, right? I showed Ree earlier. You could see the scribble mark where he actually fell asleep and dropped the pen. Sitting up in the car. Oh. Like, Zach, it couldn't have been 10 minutes in. <laughs> I, I think he's jotting all this down. I look over. I mean, the pen is on the floor. His head's cocked to the side. And he is out cold. <laughs> anyway, back from his slumber, we have Joshua the intern. Hey, I got you your fireball. We should be even. What? 
What? He got me some uh, Fireball to drink if I need it during the show. Uh, but, uh, you know, I don't think I will. But I really did uh, need it when he fell asleep on me. I thought I needed a shot right then. I thought he meant he went and bought some for you. <laughs> uh, he procured it from somewhere in the house. Oh, uh, okay, 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 okay. Yeah. All right, man. I'm really looking forward to this story. Uh, hopefully we do a good job. Let's get started. George Kelly Barnes is born on July 18, 1898 in Chicago, Illinois. He's the son of successful insurance salesman George Francis and Elizabeth Kelly Barnes. The late 1890s are exciting years for the city of Chicago. It's arguably the high point in its economic development and is widely regarded as a world city. The Windy City is growing at an astonishing rate, and in this decade, population reportedly grows by about 600,000 people. By 1900, it boasts an estimated 1.7 million people, making it among the top seven largest cities in the world. Uh, I think right now it's like third in the country, third largest. Chicago is now poised as the land of opportunity to an up-and-coming middle-class family. To those who have the ambition, the sky is the limit. One only needs the courage and vision to seize it. The Barnes family moves to Memphis while George is still a toddler. He reportedly enjoys a close relationship with his mother, who is suffering from health issues, and his older sister as well, but the relationship with his father is strained. Whatever the root cause of their issues, matters become worse when he discovers that the randy Mr. Barnes is having an affair with a one-legged woman. In his first real gangster move, George extorts his father. He threatens to reveal his indiscretion if he is not given access to the family car on demand. The philandering Mr. Barnes concedes, and George promises to keep his dirty little secret. Freedom is just a set of car keys away, and Barnes uses it to make some extra money for himself. He's only a teenager, but finds small success as a part-time bootlegger. I think we're towards the middle or end of Prohibition. It seems weird that a young guy would get right into bootlegging and stuff and have that happen, but it's not as nefarious as it sounds. Arkansas, I guess, is a wet state. And Tennessee is a dry state. So to become a quote-unquote bootlegger at this point, one needs only drive across the state line, buy some booze legally, and then stash it in your car and drive it across. Congratulations, you're, you're a bootlegger. <laughs> yeah. So that's what that's kind of what we're talking about there. And everybody did it. Right. And George, he's not like a poor. He's a middle-class kind of guy. He's got legitimate jobs as well. Uh, I think at one point he was even a golf caddy at the local country club. But he's not hes not lower class is my point. He, not at all. He didn't have to bootleg. It's, it's extra money for him. He eventually graduates from Central High School, where teachers tell reporters that he never applied himself, though he still manages to get accepted to university. It's important to realize that George is extremely literate and is by no means a dim individual. He attends Mississippi A&M in Starkville, majoring in agriculture. He is described once again as a poor student and is in constant trouble with the faculty. In his first semester alone, he is given 31 demerits, and in the first few weeks of the second semester, is handed another 24 demerits. George lasts long enough to meet Genevieve Ramsey, the daughter of a wealthy levy contractor. They elope in 1919 against the Ramsey's wishes as they disapprove of their daughter marrying so young and later have two sons. He works a brief time as a taxi driver, but soon after, the Ramseys take George into the family's construction business. George Ramsey gives his son-in-law a job as a commissary clerk with his company and tries to mentor him. Tragically, his father-in-law is killed in an accidental dynamite explosion, and the marriage ends soon after. His wife divorces him and would later say that she divorced him because he was running in bad company. In fact, she has to advertise notice to get a divorce because she didn't know where to reach him. George moves back to Memphis after his divorce and takes several jobs ranging from used car salesman to goat farmer. None of these career paths provide him with the money he needs. It's in Tennessee where he falls back on what put money in his pocket years before, moonshine. His still is discovered in 1923, and he's sentenced to six months in the county workhouse. Upon release, Barnes stays in the liquor industry and moves west. It's then that he changes his name to George Kelly, in hopes of escaping law enforcement and possibly to protect his family. Several years later, on March 14, 1927, he's arrested in New Mexico for bootlegging. He's fined $250, and he spends a few months in the New Mexico State Penitentiary. After his release, he visits Tulsa, Oklahoma, 
where he's arrested for vagrancy on July 24th. In 1928, he ends up being sentenced to Leavenworth for three years after being caught selling liquor on an Indian reservation. It won't be his first trip to the infamous federal prison, but while there, he is considered a model inmate. Kelly uses his time at Leavenworth to make new friends with bank robbers Charlie Harmon, Frank Nash, Francis Keating, and Thomas Holden. He may have helped Keating and Holden escape, but it's never proven. Kelly ends up getting out a year early, and he uses what he's learned from his new pals to take up bank robbing and larceny. Drifting to Oklahoma City, he joins forces with little Steve Anderson, who happens to be dating a little spitfire named Catherine Thorne. So the Holden Keating gang is a famous bank robbing team. They had a spree spanning from 1926 to 1932. Holden was described by the FBI as a menace to every man, woman, and child in America. And in uh, 1950, he was the first fugitive to officially make the top 10 most wanted list. The four men he met in prison, Harmon, Nash, Keating, and Holden, along with a few others, including Frank Jelly Nash and uh, Harvey Bailey, all became part of the Keating-Holden gang. This leads to, of course, several robberies. First on the list is a bank in Minnesota on July 15, 1930. The gang reportedly makes off with a $70,000 score. So you think they'd be pretty pleased with themselves, but there seems to be no pleasing Vern Miller, who starts a beef within the clan. Right? Whenever things are good, you got one guy, right? Three of the gang members, Mike Rusick, Frank Wenny Coleman, and Samuel Jew Sammy Stein, are found shot to death at White Bear Lake. Perhaps with a heavy heart, the gang goes on to rob a bank in Lincoln, Nebraska on September 9, 1930. They make off with $4 million. This caper was the brainchild of Howard Bailey, and it's so successful that the bank failed the next day. So the gang continues to rob banks in Nebraska, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and uh, Harmon ends up killed November 19th, 1931, following like a 100 grand robbery with Holden and Keaton at Menomonee, Wisconsin. Francis Keating and Tom Holden join with the Alvin Carpus Barker gang to rob a bank in Fort Scott, Kansas in uh, like June of 1932. And this leads to Keating and Holden being arrested about a month later. Okay. Now, Catherine Thorne, she's no girl next door. She's born Cleo May Brooks in Saltillo, Mississippi, but she decides that Catherine sounds a lot more glamorous. She's been married a few times and has a history of smaller crimes, including prostitution and bootlegging. She has a daughter, Pauline Fry, from an earlier marriage. Her family blames her third husband, Charlie Thorne, for introducing her to the dark side. One day, Charlie, who is an illiterate, is found dead by an apparent suicide following an argument with Catherine. Oddly, there's a typed suicide note found next to him. He learned how to read and write. Yes, magically. <laughs> a judge believes the note is written by the illiterate Charlie. Oh, my God. And Catherine's never charged with his murder. She meets Kelly when he hooks up with small-time gangster Steve Anderson, who Catherine is dating. Allegedly, Kelly moves in on Miss Thorne, and they run off together in Anderson's Cadillac. That the judge, the judge needs to be disbarred. Come on, dude. Right. I mean, and you know, the family's in denial when they're like, you know, she was on the right road until she hooked up with that third husband. Absolutely. And the more you read about her, she uses her womanly ways and flirts and does everything she can to get out of shit. You like beautiful things, Howard. More than anything else in the world. So it's not surprising to me, and it wouldn't surprise me if she perhaps, you know, did a little bargaining on the side with the judge. Oh, yeah. And she's not the only one in this story that has suspicious deaths around them, and we'll get into that. 1929 sees the beginning of the Great Depression, which by most accounts began in the United States. The Depression starts in early September of this year, and eventually makes worldwide headlines with the stock market crash on October 29th a day that becomes infamously known as Black Tuesday. While most businesses collapse in a depression, some, like illegal alcohol distribution, are immune. Catherine and Kelly team up to operate as bootleggers in Fort Worth, Texas. In 1930, they leave for St. Paul, Minnesota and get back together with Keating and Holden. Four hold up a bank and continue this path through several states. On February 28, 1930, 
Keating and Holden escape prison and flee to Minneapolis, Minnesota. That same year, Kelly and Charlie Harmon are released and join Keating and Holden. Also making her way north is Catherine Thorne, and she and George Kelly are married in Minneapolis that September. When it comes to the actual bank robberies, Catherine is of little to no use. She's not a thug or particularly skilled at larceny. She is, however, extremely gifted in the field of marketing and publicity. By most accounts, Catherine buys him his first machine gun. She encourages him to shoot walnuts off fence posts and begins to call him Machine Gun Kelly. He famously puts his last name in a signed post by shooting it out after a bank robbery, and Catherine hands out souvenir cartridge cases after his robberies. My baby can handle a Tommy gun like most men can't even handle an automatic. Machine Gun Kelly is my little baby. Best gun of them all. So at this point, they're pulling off bank robberies and throwing around ideas about kidnapping. So kidnapping is becoming a new thing for this type of outlaw for a few reasons. Okay, first of all, obviously, uh, bootlegging is coming to an end, right? The bank robbing is starting to get some heat on, right? And it's it's hard to rob a bank. You know, there's security. There's a lot of things to get into. And I've even heard accounts that, like, before a bank robbery, sometimes George Kelly would throw up or vomit. <laughs> You know, that's in some of the accounts. Oh, yeah. You know, it's it's maybe not his thing necessarily. And that they're just trying to find an easier way to make some money. So, one, it is relatively a straightforward process. You only need a wealthy guy, a place to stash him, and you need a method to collect the ransom, right? And unlike bank robbing, the outlaws can define their payday, right? You can decide how much money you intend to make off the kidnapping. Whereas a bank, you don't necessarily know what you're going to get, Right. And the third main thing is that a victim is generally unprepared and thereby harmless. There's no security detail around to cause trouble, where a bank is always expecting to be robbed. But this is kind of where the where the legend starts that he's really a nobody and she's the one that talks a good game and, and builds him up. And right. Like I said, well, later on, we'll kind of discern how true or untrue that is. Machine Gun Kelly's first attempt at kidnapping involves a former Illinois policeman named Bernard Phillips. Phillips proves to be somewhere between a bungler and a jinx. During their first attempt, Phillips's gun is said to have accidentally discharged, killing the abductee. That's a problem. Remember Pulp Fiction? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was kind of like that. But this guy's like an ex-cop. Go to Winston Wolf. He'll, so, he'll fix it. So for this you. is kind of one of my things. I'm like, wait a minute, a cop accidentally discharged? <laughs> but why would he kill him? Right? He wants to ransom. Yeah. But anyway, it goes down. The second attempt was so ill-conceived that Kelly had the sense to walk away. He correctly deduces that the intended victim was penniless. It proves to be true to Bernard Chagrin. So the way I hear this one, the guy convinces the former officer Phillips that if he lets him go, he'll somehow scrounge up the funds and bring them back to him, right? And of all the wacky turns of events, the guy doesn't come back. <laughs> <laughs> the previous caper undermines his confidence in Bernard, so Kelly decides that he'll partner up with a man named Eddie Dahl instead. Kelly and Dahl go back away, having robbed a bank together in Memphis. Dahl can also add car theft and bootlegging to his resume. On January 27, 1932, they head to South Bend, Indiana to kidnap a banker named Howard Wolverton. They leave a 50000 ransom demand with his wife and drive him around while she presumably gathers the funds to save her husband's life. It's a long drive, about two full days, when Mr. Wolverton convinces the two scallywags that his wife must be having trouble raising the money. Unable to collect the ransom, they decide to release their hostage, under the condition that he gather the funds himself and deliver it in a timely manner. Their subsequent attempts to communicate with Mr. Wolverton are not successful. Yeah, it's a little suspect that she couldn't raise the money, you know. <laughs> and, and she couldn't raise a thousand bucks and try to, to get that no, off, you know what I mean? No. Nothing, not a penny. So, sorry, I... I, I <laughs> I am tapped out. And they do try to shake him down later. They contact him and uh, they try to send him threatening messages, things like that. He just doesn't respond, you know, and he's, he's obviously more careful now and he's not going to get picked up off the street and stuff and basically blows him off. So, like I said, you know, nothing's as easy as it seems. Right. 
It's 1933 now, and the Lindbergh baby kidnapping had just gone down the year before. The resulting Lindbergh law makes kidnapping a federal offense. It's the Depression, and there is the Dust Bowl choking and killing people in its wake. It's a tough time in the United States, and kidnapping is a profitable business. Catherine is really pushing for something big. Police believe it's Catherine, and not Kelly, who has the smarts and the connections to put them in the headlines. Catherine begins studying the Texas Society pages for a target. She, Kelly, and associate Albert L. Bates pick Charles F. Urschel as their victim. He and his wife, Bernice, are one of the wealthiest couples in Oklahoma City. Charles Urschel is a guy who grows up on a farm, joins the army, serves in World War I, and then comes back to the United States to pursue anything but farming. He heads out west and meets a man named Thomas Slick. Slick is into oil development, and the two partner up. Urschel also partners up with Slick's sister, Florid Slick. They roam the countryside in search of places to drill for oil, and have quite a bit of success in their endeavors. In 1930, Tom Slick has some kind of a stroke, and later dies in surgery. The following year, Urschel's wife dies, and the two decide to marry. They form the Slick Urschel Oil Company. This transforms them into a huge power couple in the region, and the press is intrigued by their immense wealth. They are featured in high society magazines, and ultimately catch the eye of Catherine Thorne. So what intrigues me about them is that within a year, two of them die. Right. Yeah, and Slick's only like 42 years old. He's a type A kind of guy, you know, go-getter. Yeah, he dies of a heart attack. And just a year before that, or less, Herschel's wife died. Yeah. So nobody looked at that, right? No. I mean, maybe it's just because we're getting into the realm where everybody's a freaking criminal that we talk about, but another suspicious death, in my opinion. Oh. Uh, Not mine. Could just be a coincidence. Yeah. But it is, like I said, it is the Depression. Times are tough. Yes. Who knows? <laughs> Times are tough when you have to uh, kill your spouses to <laughs> conglomerate your oil wells. To monopolize. That's right. I better not be sitting on that, Jerry. Kelly's group studies the Urschels. The location of their residence place of business, and their habits. On July 22, 1933, Kelly and Bates make their move. It's late in the evening at the Urschel residence. Charles and his wife are enjoying a game of bridge with Mr. and Mrs. Walter Jarrett. Their routine, though reportedly spirited game of cards, is abruptly halted when Kelly and Bates burst through the front door. Mrs. Urschel looks up from her cards to find the business end of a machine gun staring back at her. She instinctively raises her hands in a surrendering fashion as a blood-curdling scream escapes her. Stop that! Orders one of the gunmen and assures her that he will blow their heads off, presumably because that's where the noise is coming from. <laughs> the gunmen are about to grab Charles Urschel when they are confronted with the first snag in their plan. They are unaware of which man is Urschel. They try to inquire as to his identity, but the group is uncooperative. Reportedly, Walter Jarrett decides to play the hero and stand up, but the real Urschel stands at the same time. The kidnappers decide that enough is enough and take both men. Not far out of town, it occurs to the diabolical villains that they can check the two men's pockets for identification. Sure enough, both men have their wallets, and the real Urschel is revealed. Relieving Jarrett of all but $10 for cab fare, they leave him roadside and depart for Paradise. Paradise, Texas, that is. They're heading to the Shannon Farm. I think it's an interesting sign of the time that even though they are kidnapping and they're doing all these horrible things, they give the guy cab fare. That's, <laughs> that's just an old time charm that's gone now. You know, people don't have the class that they did. Well, they're like, I'd sooner shoot him dead before I'd leave him without cab fare. <laughs> There's a, there's a classy edge to that in my opinion. Sure, sure. Well, hey, Catherine's mother is Aura Shannon. She is married to Robert G. Boss Shannon of Paradise, Texas, who's a rancher and local politician. Boss is known to make some extra money providing safe places to stay on his ranch for outlaws. It's the Depression and money is money. Boss's ranch is where Kelly works on his marksmanship. The ranch is also where he meets Shannon's son, Amon, and his wife, Alita. So they're a little bit shady. Just a little. Or are they desperate? Probably a combination. Kelly and Bates drive through Oklahoma and part of Texas to get to Paradise, which is located northwest of Dallas. Urschel is still blindfolded, but is soaking in all the sounds, voices, and smells the entire time. His incredible memory for details will haunt Kelly later. 
Unbeknownst to the kidnappers, Charles Urschel is friends with the newly elected President Franklin D. Roosevelt. And when Mrs. Urschel contacts the FBI, namely J. Edgar Hoover, all hell is about to break loose. It's not long before federal and local law enforcement, as well as numerous members of the press, descend upon the Urschel residence. It's quickly becoming a media circus. Meanwhile, the Kelly party arrives in paradise and heads straight to the Shannon farm. Oddly, all the women folk have gone to Fort Worth for a week-long shopping trip. A ransom note for 200000 is sent to the Urschel family. This is the largest ransom asked at the time. It's roughly three and a half million today. The note is composed by Urschel himself, who makes sure to leave his fingerprints on everything he could while typing it. So I think Urschel's an interesting character. He doesn't seem rattled at all by this kidnapping. No. Right? No. So he's got some seriously calm nerves, perhaps because he killed a woman himself not too long ago. He seems a little bit sociopathic <laughs> to me. You can only read so much without knowing these people and really getting into them, but there's just little red flags about everybody in this story, in my opinion. No, he's a very successful businessman. You can't run a business at the level that he's doing it being a, somebody who it can't be calm under pressure. They shoved cotton in his ears, cotton in his eyes. I mean, they really did him up. And you don't know that they're not going to kill you dead in your calm. I think to try and survive, you are. Either way, he was. So I uh, looked up the FBI historical website on this case, right? And they've actually got the, the note, so I'm going to read it. It's, quote, Immediately upon receipt of this letter, you will proceed to obtain the sum of $200,000 in genuine used Federal Reserve currency in the denomination of $20 bills. It will be useless for you to attempt taking notes of serial numbers or making up a dummy package or anything else in the line of an attempted double cross. Bear this in mind, Charles F. Herschel will remain in our custody until the money has been inspected and exchanged and furthermore will be at the scene of contact for payoff. And if there should be any attempt at any double cross, it will be he that suffers the consequence. Run this ad for one week in the Daily Oklahoman. For sale, 160 acres of land, good five-room house, deep well, also cows, tools, tractor, corn, and hay. $3,750 for a quick sale. Terms. So that's what they're supposed to do. And he says, you'll hear from us as soon as convenient after insertion of the ad. So, of course, the ad was placed. On July 28th, an envelope addressed to the Daily Oklahoman, Box H807, was received. It was from Joplin, Missouri. A letter to Kirkpatrick read in part, Quote, You will pack $200,000 and use genuine Federal Reserve notes of $20 denomination in a suitable light-colored leather bag and have someone purchase transportation for you, including berth aboard a train, number 28 to Sooner, which departs at 10.10 p.m. via the MK&T lines for Kansas City, Missouri. You will ride on the observation platform where you may be observed by someone at some station along the line between Oklahoma City and KC, Missouri. If indications are right, somewhere along the right of way, you will observe a fire on the right side of the track, facing direction the train is bound. The first fire will be your cue to prepare to throw the bag to track immediately after passing the second fire. Remember this, if any trickery is attempted, you will find the remains of Urschel, and instead of joy, there will be double grief. For someone very near and dear to the Urschel family is under constant surveillance and will likewise suffer for your error there is the slightest hitch in these plans for any reason whatsoever, not your fault, you will proceed into Kansas City, Missouri and register at the Muhlenbach Hotel under the name of E.E. E. Kincaid of Little Rock, Arkansas and await further instructions there. The main thing is do not divulge the contents of this letter to any law authorities for we have no intention of further communication. We are making this trip Saturday, July 29th, 1933. So this is pretty well planned, planned out. out. Yeah, they got it all planned. So, Ree, do you think this is Catherine's plan or his? I think it's both. I think she's probably done most of the research and stuff. Yeah, it seems like it's really particularly well thought out, especially when you think of how bungled and amateurish their other attempts had been. But you got to think, too, like from the bank planning, 
like they were with Bailey. Bailey was a planner. Yes. So was he involved in this? Well, maybe they used his knowledge from previous attempts. His methodology? Or maybe he was a little bit involved. I don't know. Who knows? Maybe they consulted him. Who knows? But it's pretty elaborate. It is. I, I'm impressed with it. The ransom is paid with marked $20 bills and Urschel is returned home safely nine days later. The Kelly gang hightails it out of Texas and heads for Minneapolis. Once there, they exchange a portion of the ransom money for clean money, which was common practice for kidnappers back in the day. From this point, they decide to split up and meet back together soon. Bates heads to Denver, and then the Kellys head toward Chicago. The kidnapping is the first after the Lindbergh Law, and J. Edgar Hoover promises to find the quote-unquote dirty yellow rats responsible. Urschel's memory serves as the best tool for the FBI in solving the case. He had been checking his watch secretly during his captivity. He knows it took approximately six hours to reach his destination after he was first taken. He remembers the sound of oil pumps in nearby fields. He recalls the sound of a twin-engine airplane flying overhead each day, except for one when it rained. He overhears his captors talking about other crimes they had committed. If he's doing all this while, you know, basically having a gun to his head the whole time, pretty calm. He is, and and his memory is his best asset. Uh, when stopping to fuel the large car they had, which Ursel guesses to be either a Cadillac or a Buick, the kidnappers ask the station attendant about the local weather, and she replies, the crops are all burned up, so... He knows there's some place where there's been a drought or a heat wave. Yeah, he's picking up everything possible. Yes. The farmhouse where he's held at the end of the two-day trip was home to cows, pigs, and chickens. The water is drawn from a well northwest of the house with a creaking windlass, and it had a strong mineral flavor. So those are things that can tell them about the area that this farm is at. Uh, he's also able to loosen his blindfold enough to glimpse at his watch often. Twice a day, an aircraft does pass overhead at 9.45 and 5.45 p.m. But on Sunday, there's a torrential rainstorm and the morning plane didn't show, and he remembers that. The fingerprints also that he left everywhere, like when he was typing that note, he was leaving them on the paper, on the desk, on everything to show that he was there. So if they ever were able to find a place where they thought that this might be where he was held, there's going to be evidence there. Uh, that's what I mean. He's no dummy. Right. Right. And he seems pretty determined he's going to get his money back. Oh, absolutely. And he's going to get out of there alive and get these people. There's reports that Catherine wanted to kill. Yes. The hostage. She didn't intend to return him. She thought that was too risky. Machine Gun Kelly, he's like, no, what are you crazy? Because they had planned to do other ones too. I think they had a plan to kidnap five people. And it, in the end, it would have been like $10 million. And they were going to go down to Mexico and just retire oh. and live forever. You know, that was, that was their plan. Right. And he's like, nobody's going to pay us if we kill them. You know? Right. So, so her plan to kill him seemed short sighted and stupid. But in hindsight, like re returning him was risky. Maybe Catherine had some sense of that. But Catherine is a killer. She obviously killed her late husband. Kelly, if you read about him, he's amicable. But he's also putting guns in people's faces and he's robbing people. And the whole thing is when they were bank robbing and stuff, they're running around with real gangsters. Like they're not like Italian mafia style gangsters, but they knew them. They knew the Chicago outfit. Like they right. had connections. They had connections right. with these people. It doesn't make sense that he's this happy-go-lucky guy that never meant any harm. You know what I mean? I, I just don't buy it. He's not Johnny Dangerously. But I wonder if that insect part of Catherine's brain was telling her, like, this guy... Needs to go. He's dangerous. He's, yeah, her gut was telling her, we shouldn't let this guy go. And in hindsight, she was right. But she didn't know. She was shopping for the whole week. She wasn't there until the very end she was there. She got back the Sunday they took him back. She, her daughter, her mom, and Amon's wife, Shannon's daughter-in-law. Hoover puts Gus Jones, one of his best agents, in charge of the case. Jones focuses on Urschel's account of the trip and figures he must have been within 600 miles of Oklahoma City. He reaches out to every airline that flies in that range, looking for flight interruptions or cancellations due to rain on the Sunday Urschel noted. He also looks for an area where there had been a drought. 
American Airways tells Jones that a morning flight from Fort Worth to Amarillo was delayed on Sunday, July 30th because of a powerful rainstorm just north of Paradise, Texas. He then checks with the U.S. Weather Bureau, who confirms the storm, but also states that the storm is welcomed due to the driest growing season for the farmers in Paradise. The drought, folks. The drought. FBI agents swarm the small town of Paradise with Urschel. He insists on going with them so he can see the place his captors held him. He reportedly rides in the lead car with a sawed-off shotgun across his lap. The feds check each farm for the specifics Urschel provides them. Finally, they reach the ranch of Boss Shannon and everything matches. One of the agents remembers that Catherine Kelly, Shannon's stepdaughter, is married to Machine Gun Kelly. Urschel sees the chair he was handcuffed to, the cuff he drank from, and hears the creaking windlass and animal sounds. He even checks the water to make sure it has the awful taste he remembers. Mrs. Shannon hadn't had the time to clean, apparently, and the fingerprints Urschel left are everywhere. Lazy bitch. But you have to remember, too, that he grew up on a farm. So that was that was second nature to him, and uh, all those little details and stuff would come naturally to him. The other thing is, his wealth and influence was just pivotal in this investigation. Like, the FBI had very little resources. They weren't even supposed to carry guns, right? They had just uh, done the Lindbergh kidnapping, and they kind of botched that. That was going nowhere. Edgar Hoover was in trouble. There's a lot of things going wrong for the FBI. Urschel used a friend and borrowed a plane, and that's how they did the surveillance to find the farm. Okay. Like, he's taking this head on. He wants people to be held accountable. The FBI arrests Robert and Ora Shannon, as well as Harvey Bailey. Bailey is in possession of some of the marked ransom. He has also used one of Kelly's machine guns in a previous robbery, which was tied to the Urschel kidnapping. According to the FBI, Bailey has escaped from the Kansas State Penitentiary at Lansing, Kansas, on May 30th, 1933, where he was serving a sentence of 10 to 50 years on a charge of robbing a bank at Fort Scott, Kansas. He also was wanted in connection with the murder of three police officers, an FBI special agent, and their prisoner Frank Nash at Kansas City on June 17, 1933. This is known as the infamous Kansas City Massacre. About Bailey... He's known as one of the most competent bank robbers in American history. As a matter of fact, most of the guys that plan bank robberies today are using his model. He's the guy that would case a bank, figure out how many cops there were, did they have cars, how many cars, and uh, what time of day is it least frequented. He would have like all the things that you you do now that are kind of textbook. Bailey did it. He also loaned Kelly money. He loaned Kelly $1,000 before this. So he was in possession of Kelly's money because Kelly paid him back. There's also some uh, discrepancy about where he was. Most reports say he was in a cot sleeping in the backyard. But it's the Dust Bowl where they talk about winds that are choking livestock and people. And sometimes, like, you couldn't see the dust was so thick and stuff. So just my logic says he's probably not sleeping outside on a cot. Probably was inside. But a lot of this stuff is just myth and legend. Just two weeks after the release of Urschel, The government is already preparing its case in Oklahoma City against Catherine's mother, stepfather, Armin Shannon, Bates, Bailey, and five people who purchased some of the money from St. Paul. At first, the Kellys were figuring they hadn't been identified, but soon the arrests of their people are splashing across the newspapers, even where they were. Catherine, now in Des Moines, sends a crazy letter on August 18th to the Oklahoma Assistant Attorney General, Joseph B. Keenan, stating... The entire Urschel family and friends and all of you will be exterminated soon. There is no way I can prevent it. I will gladly put George Kelly on the spot for you if you will save my mother, who is innocent of any wrongdoing. If you do not comply with this request, there is no way in which I can prevent the most awful tragedy. If you refuse my offer, I shall commit some minor offense and be placed in jail so that you will know that I have no connection with the terrible slaughter that will take place in Oklahoma within the next few days. It doesn't work. Now the feds need to find anyone else involved, most importantly the Kellys. Catherine and George decide to lay low and have buried most of their share of the ransom around area farms. They drive around the southwest for weeks. The Kellys can feel the FBI closing in. Right, so Catherine helps George bleach his hair blonde, and she's like wearing a red wig. So Geraldine Arnold is the 12-year-old daughter of some friends that they just met on the road hitchhiking. Now, the Arnolds are in pretty bad shape. It's the Depression. And the Kellys help them out with some money in exchange for favors, like uh, buying cars for them, stuff like that. 
At some point, the favors escalate to, hey, can I borrow your kid? And incredibly, the Arnolds concede. There is a lot of stories regarding the time they spent on the lamb. And uh, one of the best accounts I heard was regarding their time in Chicago. So the heat's on them and they're no longer the cool gangsters to hang out with. Uh, the only one who will really help them is a component associate named Joe Burgle. And he's like a famous mechanic for the mob. He gets them some cash, whiskey, and a getaway car that apparently can get up to like 100 miles an hour, which is huge back then. And it's said that Kelly's a pretty competent driver. Also, the feds nearly pin him down at a bar once where he's arranging transportation to Tennessee. They knew about the bar, but they failed to set up the proper surveillance, and they never did actually go inside. If they had, they'd have grabbed him because he was in there for like two days trying to set up his path to Memphis. The guy that botched the stakeout outside the bar, which I think is called like the Michigan Tavern, if I'm not mistaken, he was the same guy that gunned down Dillinger. Ah. Yeah. And like I said, it's also important to remember as the feds are chasing him around, they're not allowed to carry weapons. Right? That's great. So what do they do? Throw yeah. rocks well, they, at Well, they're having to cooperate with local law enforcement and stuff. Their hands are tied in a lot of situations. Now, that being said, the FBI was predominantly present when one of Dillinger's guys was gunned down. And it was like a smoke and mirrors reporting on who shot him. It was the FBI that shot him, probably carrying illegal weapons and stuff. But they're, they're not like the G-men we see today, right? Like some other stuff I wanted to throw in. It's interesting. J. Edgar Hoover, he's in charge of the FBI. And you've got FDR, who's president. FDR appoints a attorney general. So he appoints an AG named Walsh. Walsh has a history with Hoover, back from the Harding administration. And the way I hear it, Walsh was a senator, I think from Miami or something. And J. Edgar Hoover is appointed to kind of defame him and smear him because there's some political beef. So, you know, J. Edgar Hoover, let's say it, he was kind of a douchebag. Totally was. Yeah. He's trying to set him up with a prostitute. He's trying to smear him. He's like trying to get the dirt on him constantly. It doesn't work, right? The only thing he does is piss Walsh off. So when he appoints Walsh, the first thing Walsh is going to do is get rid of Hoover. And I think he even used words to that effect, like, I'm going to get rid of that son of a bitch or effing Hoover, whatever he said, right? But he's like <laughs> 72. He goes and he marries this young Cuban girl. And I think he's found dead, like, not too long after. He never wow. quite gets to Washington, I, I believe. And uh, he dies. But again, you've got a enemy of Herbert Hoover who's coming up there to kick Hoover out. And he turns up dead. Right. Now he's 72. Maybe not shady, but also could be shady. Is it beyond Hoover to kill him? Right. Yeah, I don't think so. Anyway, no. they end up using this guy Cummings, and Cummings is the guy that spearheads this whole thing. And he's kind of like uh, Nancy Reagan with the war on drugs. There's a war on crime. There's a war on everything and stuff. So he's basically got the war on the Kellys. They're Like I said, they're not looking good from the Lindbergh thing. So this is their big chance, and they're going to make this. You know, In Machine Gun Kelly, they're going to make this their claim to fame. I mean, people were quick to blame yeah. J. Edgar Hoover for killing John F. Kennedy, so I don't think it's a, I don't think this is a stretch. <laughs> Everybody's been blamed for killing Kennedy. <laughs> that's that's true. Even you, Zach. <laughs> also, Hoover is starting to get very conscious about the publicity on this, and movies are coming out like Scarface, yeah. and there there's all these gangsters. Gangsters are getting popular in the media and film and stuff. He puts the kibosh on it and basically says you can't do movies about gangsters, you know, and he uses his influence to do that. And if you are, there has to be an FBI guy in the movie and Hoover has to approve the script. <laughs> so that's when you come out with movies like G-Men and stuff like that. And he's, he's really painting this national narrative that A, Kelly is a dangerous, sick individual and B, the FBI are the heroes and the good guys and the tough guys. But the reality is when they went around trying to find gunmen and tough guys that could take on a gang of machine gun toting villains, you know, basically, they only had like 12 guys out of 300 that were uniquely qualified to be like even confrontational with these guys. So it's a, it's a huge marketing ploy versus the reality of the situation. Interesting. The Kellys end up in Memphis in early September 1933. George knows people here and decides to call his ex-brother-in-law, Langford Ramsey. Ramsey sends them to a home at 1408 Rainer. The Kellys will hide there until they come up with a plan and some money. In a desperate move, they send little Geraldine and Ramsey 
to retrieve the buried loot. She knows the location of the money-filled thermos jugs. Unfortunately, agents have already found some of the money buried on one of the farms. Ramsey gets wind of this and decides to send the girl home to her family. One step ahead, the law is waiting at the train station for the child. She quickly told them that Kelly and Catherine were in Tennessee. Special agents are sent to Memphis. They got to the kid. <laughs> Kids are rats. They just <laughs> train. Bates, considered a hardened criminal with a lengthy record, is taken into custody in Denver, Colorado on August 12, 1933 on a local charge. At the time of his arrest, he has in his possession $660, later identified by bureau agents as part of the Urschel ransom money. He also has a machine gun. So on September 4, 1933, Harvey J. Bailey, remember him? Oh, yeah. Arrested on the Shannon Ranch on August 12th mm -hmm. and has previously escaped from the Kansas City Penitentiary. He escapes from the Dallas County Jail. He's escaped by removing three bars from his cell by the means of hacksaws, and he'd been smuggled a revolver. So Bailey's freedom is short-lived. He's taken back into custody, basically on the same day of his escape in Oklahoma. On the morning of September 26, 1933, federal agents walk through an open front door of bungalow. Kelly has retrieved the newspaper off the front porch the evening before and forgets to lock the door. The authorities meet up with Kelly in the hall as he exits the bathroom holding a pistol. Guns drawn, Kelly backs down and feds charge him with kidnapping and massacre. Catherine is apprehended in a back room. J. Edgar calls Kelly and his gang of desperados the most dangerous ever encountered. Okay, so there's various accounts from the babyfacejournal.com, if you ever go there. Uh, newspapers reported that Sergeant William Rainey of the Memphis Police Department knocked on the door and Kelly opened it and stuck out his 45 automatic. The newspaper account said Rainey, who is a big and powerful man, pushed his shotgun against Kelly's stomach. It was a tense second, but Rainey's coolness and the look that was in his blue eyes won. Right? This is Hoover. Okay. So, writer and crime historian Rick Maddox reports that Memphis police burst into the house where Kelly was staying. As Rainey, armed with a sawed off shotgun, entered Kelly's room, he found him standing there in his pajamas, hung over and holding a 45. Catherine was asleep on the bed next to him. During the night, the two of them had consumed six quarts of gin. The sergeant jammed his shotgun into Kelly's stomach and ordered him to drop the gun, which Kelly did on his own foot. Ow! I've been waiting for you all night, Kelly was said to have muttered. Another somewhat humorous version comes from Bruce Barnes, Kelly's son. He, he said a guy named Titchener told him a story years later that Kelly had picked up the morning newspaper but failed to relock the front door. He walked into the bathroom while the police entered the house. When the police burst into the bathroom, Kelly was still relieving himself. Although his gun was in the bathroom, he didn't have time to grab it. Okay. So, of course, the last version comes from the FBI archive. FBI agents, armed with automatics, machine guns, and shotguns, even though they're not allowed to carry them, burst through the doors of a Memphis rooming house and confronted Kelly, who was fully clothed and wearing a coat and hat. Kelly pulls his hands out of his pockets, drops a gun on the steps, and cries out, Don't shoot, G-Man! Don't shoot! <laughs> In a masterpiece of public relations propaganda, the FBI takes full credit for the arrest. Hoover, his agents, Hollywood, and the rest of the country eat it up. In October of 1933, the Kellys and the Shannons are all sentenced to life in prison. It's the first conviction under the Lindbergh Law. 21 persons are convicted in this case, the sentences including six life sentences and other sentences totaling 58 years, two months, and three days. The trial is a spectacle. Right? This thing goes on and on. It's a media frenzy. And uh, this is where they're really building up Machine Gun Kelly. And even like before movies, you know how they have little news clips? It's Machine Gun Kelly all day long before you're watching a movie. You know, like a lot of blow up things happen. He thinks that federal agent in the courthouse is hitting on Catherine. And if tears don't stop him, honey, I can always show him a little leg. So he kind of like jumps up and attacks him and they end up pistol whipping George nice. in the court. Yeah. And there's pictures of him. Uh, I'll post him on Instagram. He's got a big old nut on his head, you know, where they hit him with a gun and, and uh, he's crazy. He's going to outsmart him and stuff, you know, and they're like reading a warrant against him. And he's like, I'm not going to sign that, you know, and a uh, judge is like, it's a warrant. You don't sign it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it's just, it's a kind of a media spectacle and stuff. It's uh, it was interesting. And of course she's playing the victim, you know. 
You get the chair, and I'll plead that I'm a woman, and I'm scared of you. It'll be a nice touch, huh? So she's just totally flipped, and she's, you know, a victim of him, and she, she does what she does best. Machine Gun Kelly is sent to Alcatraz in California. Yeah, pretty much. But uh, when he's in Alcatraz, this is when he becomes repentant. And I think this is where the Pop Gun Kelly comes from, you know, because he wasn't in jail acting like the badass. He's repentant. He's taking classes and stuff, trying to better himself. Uh, he's never getting out, but he's trying. He, I think he actually kind of helps talk up Bailey, and Bailey does get out. Bailey gets out and uh, ends up being a cabinet man. Ah. Oh, what do you know? Which, uh, if people don't know, I'm kind of a cabinet cabinet man myself. That's how far <laughs> you can fall if you're not careful, kids. <laughs> so uh, that's where they're calling him Pop Gun Kelly and stuff. He also writes several letters to Ursula, begging his forgiveness and saying, like, no crime would be worth where I'm at. You know, no life lived could justify the, the existence I have here. And he hated Alcatraz, which you're supposed to, right? Al Capone was there. The worst of the worst are there, you know? And Kelly's there. Now, right. the question would be, does Kelly belong there, or is he just a victim of this overhyped thing? I never wanted any other. I didn't want to be public enemy number one. It's your fault. It's your fault. I don't know. But uh, I, the way I understand it, Ursul never responds to any of his letters or really forgives him. I don't blame him. No. Yeah, you got to forgive, right? You got to get a loving heart. No. 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 All he did was kidnap him. <laughs> like he it's a nice ride around the countryside that's all that's... yeah trust me there's been worse people kidnapped man if the mexicans get you they throw you down in a hole i saw a guy get kidnapped and uh he was kind of a plump rich guy he was a skinny dude when he got returned and it wasn't that long how did you see this yeah when i was in cancun <laughs> just saw it no you know this is my thing oh. I, I i look into this stuff on a documentary he has moved to Leavenworth, Kansas in the early 50s and dies of heart failure on his 59th birthday in 1954. Boss Shannon arranges for him to be buried at his own family's cemetery. Over half of the ransom is never recovered and is presumed to be still buried in Texas. George Kelly has never been shown to have shot his machine gun in any of his crimes and the police massacres he's accused of are attributed to others. Eventually, President Roosevelt pardons Boss Shannon in 1944. He dies in 1956. Charles Urschel dies in 1970. Here's the New York Times headline, Charles Urschel, oil man, is dead. San Antonio, Texas, September 26, 1970. Charles F. Urschel, an oil man and philanthropist who was kidnapped by the Machine Gun Kelly Gang in 1933 and ransomed for nearly $200,000, died at a local hospital today. He was in his 80s. Mr. Urschel was a founding trustee of the Southwest Research Institute and the Southwest Foundation for Research and Education, both of San Antonio. Survivors include two sons, Charles F. Urschel Jr. and Earl F. Slick, a daughter, Mrs. Louise J. Moorman, two sisters, 11 grandchildren, and seven great-grandchildren. Here's an interesting point that I found out. Catherine's daughter stayed in contact with the judge that had sentenced the whole gang. She wanted to go to school. I believe she wanted to be a teacher, but life was hard, so she couldn't pay for her education. It was always rumored the judge paid for her education because um, she ended up going to school, graduating and all that good stuff. And then after the judge in the case passed away, they actually found letters with check stubs in the amount of the tuition of Catherine's daughter, and it was paid by Charles Urschel. So he was banging her? <laughs> he was not. It's Catherine's daughter, and he was paying for her education because he felt bad. He had obviously seen her and possibly met her on the last day of his kidnapping, and he understood that she's a victim of circumstance. She's in a pretty crappy family. It's just nice, you know, that her life ended up okay because of the man that her parents kidnapped. This concludes the legend of George Machine Gun Kelly. A couple of things I wanted to throw out, you know, off the subject of this is uh, 
I'm still doing that radio thing with Gunner. So if you get a chance, check it out. It's on 910 AM Superstation. You can go to www.910amsuperstation.com. He's on uh, Detroit time, 7 p.m. And I usually come on around eight and it's been pretty cool. He's got great guests. He's got uh, Larry Mazza. I got to talk to him, uh, John Panisi and uh, John Damore. I just got a signed book from him and uh, it's been really cool. Uh, or he's going to be on there and a bunch of other people, Scott Deach from Tampa and uh, just check it out. It's, it's getting better and better. You know, we're a little winging it together with the uh, COVID and stuff, you know, we're on different places and stuff, but he does a great job like he always does. And uh, he's kind of a natural for it. And stuff. So check it out. Then uh, the other thing is, I keep forgetting to mention, I've posted all our stuff on YouTube. And I think most people get us on Spotify, things like that. Even the people that like hook us up on Spotify and stuff, if you could just go to YouTube real quick and just subscribe to us, you don't have to listen. But I need like a thousand subscribers before we can make any jack and stuff. And uh, YouTube's uh, the land of uh, hostility. It's an uh, exercise in patience. You got to really uh, put up with some some shit some cool people you know it's some legit criticism and stuff and then you get some douchebags but it's all that's youtube right and this is why i kind of stay away from it but we're on so help us out appreciate it all right man that was a long one we got through it though so zach's working on a gas pipe and i've been doing a lot of uh, recording sessions with bill stacks most people probably know who he is if you don't google him check him out cool guy meets tons of people he's already introduced me to a ton of people and stuff and uh, a lot of big guys like him and uh, do a show and stuff but they don't realize that stacks was actually kind of a gangbanger himself he was in a gang called 20 love and uh, we usually do italian gangsters and bosses and things like that but uh He's got a good story. I've known him for a while now. And uh, I was like, man, I'm going to do your story. And if I put it together right and don't screw it up, I think you're really going to enjoy it. You know, regardless of what you think of street gangs or whatever, I think you're going to like this. So uh, be sure and check it out. It's coming out pretty soon. All right, that's it. We're going to call it quits. I hope you guys have a good night and God bless. Thank you for listening to Partners in Crime. This week's episode is an adaptation of several different historical accounts. Music is courtesy of Kevin McLeod. All sources and attribute links can be found in the show notes. If you enjoyed this episode, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Partners in Crime Podcast. Links are in the show notes. If you didn't like the show, keep your mouth shut. No one likes a rat.